These are the leaders of the psychedelic community that you're going to see here this morning. Now, Rick's professional goal is to develop legal contexts for the beneficial uses of psychedelics and marijuana, primarily as prescription medicines, but also for personal growth for healthy people, and eventually to become a legally licensed psychedelic therapist. Uh, Rick and MAPS are one of the most instrumental groups in uh, um, stimulating the recent psychedelic renaissance, and I will turn you over to Rick now. Rick. Thank you. I woke up this morning with um, some messages on my phone asking me if I was okay and if my family was okay. I'm from Belmont, from Massachusetts, and um, my son was locked down at, at home. Um, explosions were going off 10 minutes from our house. People were getting killed. Um, my daughter was at the marathon, watching the marathon in Boston. She was at mile 20, fortunately. And so to be here with a group of people working on technologies of peace and healing is especially meaningful to me this morning. I, I do think that a lot of our work is the antidote to war and to violence, and that's the, the big vision that we're working towards. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the MAP staff for doing incredible work organizing this conference and bringing us all together. This uh, conference has cost us over $400,000 to put on. And thanks to all of you, we've brought in more than that. And it shows the, the strength of our community, that when we come together, when the, or, the us all organizations come together, we can really make enormous progress that we can't do by ourselves. So it's the, the strength of our community that's really the main message here. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dieter Hagenbach and Lucius Wertmuller from Gaia Media. Um, they were the ones that first started these large international conferences on psychedelics in the 21st century, with the first one being in 2006 in Basel for Albert Hoffman's 100th birthday, and the second one uh, being in 2008 for the World Psychedelic Forum. And then they graciously uh, let us bring these to the United States, and we had our Psychedelic Science 2010, and then now Psychedelic Science 2013. And after this conference, <coughs> we're going to be handing it back to them to organize the next large conference in Europe. And so I'm really glad to be able to pass the baton back to them and have the conferences in really good shape to see what they can do next. Um, now, today is actually also the 70th anniversary of the discovery of LSD, the psychedelic properties of LSD. <laughs> um, Um, as you might guess, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> um, and we've um, chosen this time for the conference for several reasons. Um, one of them is that for many of us, LSD was the first introduction to psychedelics. And so we're here to honor that, and it was for me as well. Um, but also, in a sense, to honor Albert and to um, recognize that in his life, not just in his scientific discoveries, but in his life, he typified what we are trying to accomplish with the mainstreaming of psychedelics, that he had um, what you might say the classic traditional life. He was married to the same woman for over 70 years. He had a loving family. He had a long and stable career that was very successful. And he showed that you could have psychedelic mystical experiences and remain and become even deepened part of your own community. And I think that's the message that we really are trying to get across to our larger culture, that we are here not as part of a counterculture, but as part of the culture. If you look at all of us who are here and what we've done and what we've accomplished and where we've been and where we're going, we're um, just like a a part of the, the whole culture. We're, we're not different. And that's, I think, what we're hoping to accomplish more and more and to communicate. Now, <laughs> my, this is also like the 41 uh, year anniversary, 41 and a half of my first LSD experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and at the time, I, I, had, I had grown up, um, born in 1953, I was, um, deeply traumatized by the Holocaust. I was raised with that awareness, and I felt like 
I was um, sort of charged by my family and my family's history to do something about that. So I, I knew that I needed to respond to the, the depths of the psyche where people scapegoat and people project and people dehumanize. But I, I didn't really know how to do it. Uh, but I felt that that was my family imposed mission and the, the mission of history for the time that I was born. And then I started um, recognizing that in my own culture there was the Vietnam War and I was being asked to kill. I was the last year of the, the draft, the lottery. And so I, I chose to be a draft resistor and uh, thought I would go to jail for that. Um, and, and I ended up though identifying myself um, once I had my LSD experience, which really cut so deep, it felt like it went to the depths of the psyche that um, where we can make these changes. And it, it had these intimations of uh, spirituality and connection. Um, but I identified myself as a counterculture uh, drug using criminal. <laughs> and I felt that that was really um, a mistake. And I think that one of the biggest mistakes of the 60s was this sort of acceptance of the idea that we're part of a counterculture. And that's what we're trying to overcome. And I think now you can see me here in my picture there in a suit and tie that <laughs> we're trying to really um, move and mainstream our, our work. And I look back and I think how lucky I was that that 18-year-old somehow or other was able to pierce through all the propaganda and have an experience with LSD that brought me um, a life's mission and that still all these years later seems uh, to be exactly what I should be doing. <laughs> now, we, we're here um, enjoying the freedom of assembly. We're here enjoying the freedom of speech and we're here enjoying the freedom of the press if you see all the books that have been published. And we need to really give thanks to America, to the freedoms that we have here, and to the ability to be able to, uh, um, to move forward as much as possible. And yet at the same time, we have to acknowledge that we fundamentally are not free in ma major ways, that we do not have the freedom of thought, that we do not have the ability legally to explore the full range of human consciousness using whatever tools we choose. Some will use psychedelics, some will use other methods. But the fundamental freedom of thought still needs to be won. And the freedom of individual religion, there's the freedom of religion, but many of us have trouble with organized religion in one way or another. And so we need a freedom of individualized spirituality. And I think that's something that will still be accomplished in the uh, decades and generations to come. And we also should not take for granted that now we have more psychedelic research happening than at any time in the last 40 years. It's, um, but at the same time, here we are in California, we do not have the uh, ability to do medical marijuana research. Science is being blocked by politics when it comes to medical marijuana. On um, Monday, we lost a major lawsuit. We have been trying for 13 years to uh, break the government monopoly on the supply of marijuana so that we could conduct scientific research the FDA is an open door to scientific research, but the National Institute on Drug Abuse has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana, and if you want to make the plant into a medicine, they don't want to give you the marijuana. And so we've been trying to break that, and we um, won an administrative law judge lawsuit, but the DEA uh, overruled the, the judge, and we sued in the appeals court, and we just lost. So unfortunately, medical marijuana is going to be addressed through political means, uh, Illinois just is going to be making marijuana uh, medicine for the, I think, the 20th state, but it's not going to be addressed through science, and I think that's a tragedy. So we should really appreciate the freedoms that we have here with psychedelic research. Um, why is this so important? And I, I think it's so important because, as Albert Einstein said, it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. And that's what I felt when I first did LSD, that I was way overdeveloped intellectually and way underdeveloped emotionally and spiritually. And if you look at the technologies that we have and the things that they're doing around the world, um, we're not really capable of handling them wisely. And that's what we're trying to work on. Um, Albert Einstein also said, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, and we thus drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. A new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move towards higher levels. 
but what is this new type of thinking? I think uh, Robert Mueller, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, wrote this book in the early 80s. And what he was suggesting is that we have the United Nations to mediate conflicts between nations, but many of these conflicts are based on religious conflicts and tribal conflicts. And we need to understand deep down that we're part of the human family, that we're part of the web of life on Earth. And if we can identify that way, then the differences that we have of our country, of our religion, of our gender, of our race, um, socioeconomic status, all these differences are less than what we have in common. And then we can learn to appreciate differences. And I think for many of us, and for me personally, psychedelics were the tool to help me get to this global spirituality, this sense of together. And when millions and billions of people have that experience, we will have the basis for a more peaceful world. Um, the preamble to the UNESCO Constitution said, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And we're trying to do that. Uh, recently, we were invited to the Pentagon. And uh, we were able to uh, speak about our interest in doing work with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD with active duty military and with veterans. And we we're invited back again in a couple weeks. And so the discussions are ongoing. I'm not sure how they're going to turn out. But the fact is that there is an open hand on the other side, that we're reaching out but the system as it is is also reaching toward us in dire need for help for the veterans. So I think we're trying to break down these, these barriers. And one thing that gives me great hope in terms of the mainstreaming of psychedelics is the progress we're making with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Our first study was in Spain, uh, 2000 to 2002 with Jose Carlos Busso, and it was unfortunately shut down for political reasons and we were not able to resume, but then later in 2004, we were able to start in the US, and we've had studies in Switzerland, in Israel, and in Canada, and we're working to start research in Australia, in England, and possibly Kosovo and other places. So we are making great progress here. Um, and just in the last week, a lot of things have happened that are just amazing. We've had, um, the on Wednesday, we had the first MDMA session in Israel. We've been working for three years to try to get this study started, and the first session, this is the treatment session room. Um, it's, it's the largest um, uh, mental hospital in Israel run by the Ministry of Health, and they've given us our own building to renovate just for psychedelic sessions. Um, for four years after our protocol was approved by Health Canada and the IRB, we've been stuck because we haven't been able to get the import-export permits to get the MDMA into Canada. And so on Tuesday, finally, uh, we're not giving up, and Health Canada finally realized it. And so nine grams of MDMA uh, arrived. We had to spend over $7,000 to secure the pharmacy with bulletproof glass, with safes, with alarm systems. <laughs> All for $1,500 worth of MDMA. <laughs> but it's there, and we finally did it. So the Canadian study is about to start. <laughs> yeah. um, we're starting a new study in Boulder, and uh, we were just informed yesterday by the Denver DEA that the forms to order the MDMA should be there any day. Now, <laughs> the, Dr. Vanderveer got his uh, Schedule 1 license almost two months ago, and we thought, all right, we're ready to start. Well, the forms, which should have been an easy thing, have supposedly been mailed to the wrong address several times. <laughs> they, they haven't arrived, but now we've been assured that they're going to arrive. So we're going to be able to start our Boulder study very soon. And in our current study with veterans in uh, Charleston, uh, one of the subjects said, I'm 100% different than what I was when I started. Uh, what we've accomplished. Uh, we've developed a treatment manual that's standardized our therapy. We don't think our therapy is perfect, but we've described it, and we have adherence criteria for therapists to be able to, uh, for independent raters to review the videotapes and give feedback on therapist adherence to the manual. And this is what we need to do to be able to uh, collect the data from all different sites to show it's the same drug and the same therapy. What we've learned so far is that we can enroll people with PTSD from any cause. Our first major study was uh, mostly women survivors of childhood sexual abuse and adult rape and assault, and our current study with veterans with war-related trauma. And so our treatment method can work, we've discovered, with any cause of PTSD. 
um, what we're still trying to figure out, these are the various doses that we're using in our studies, in our phase two studies. We've used inactive placebo, 25 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 40, 50, 75, and 125. And the first thing, most importantly, is safety. And so we have assured ourselves and the FDA and regulatory authorities around the world that 125 milligrams followed roughly uh, one to two hours later with 62 and a half is a sufficiently safe dose with screened patients in a clinical context. And we're getting surprisingly good results at 75 milligrams as well. But all of these doses have been demonstrated to be safe in our context. We're trying to understand about efficacy as well. And the other thing that we're trying to figure out is how to do a double blind. That was the classic criticism of the early psychedelic research. And so we're looking at these different doses to try to figure out at which doses do people confuse with other doses and where do they confuse them with the inactive placebo. And as you can guess, it's uh, uh, pretty easy for people to tell. <laughs> but we're still struggling. So we're still struggling with the double blind issue. Um, this is our drug development plan. Um, just to show you that in the U.S. we have uh, started in 2004. Um, actually, you know, I started MAPS in 1986 to try to bring uh, MDMA back into uh, medicine and therapy. Uh, but we're now projecting uh, 2021 will be the year that we have MDMA approved by the FDA. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very possible that, that this could actually happen. Um, for many of you who are psychologists and therapists, um, this is a, a slide about the therapist training program, that we're going to be training certain number of, the bar on the, um, your, la, your that side, the small bar, is the uh, number of therapists we're predicting to train each year, and the, white, the larger bar is the cumulative. And the, it's two shades. White on top is if we get permission for compassionate use, called expanded access, once we start phase three, and the greener, colors, the lower colors, are the numbers of therapists that we're going to need for uh, phase two and phase three. Probably 80 to 100 therapists we're going to be needing to train to work on our studies. Um, we're going to need roughly $3 million to finish phase two and roughly $15 million for phase three. And we already have $5 million that's been given to us in a bequest by Ashana Haley that we're reserving for our phase three MDMA PTSD. So thank you to Ashana, who was a guiding light on our board of directors. Um, and our, our goal here is that one day, like Hefter, which is working so much with psilocybin, that we're working to have a medicine, a product at the other end. And if so, we can have an engine of funding to continue to support further research, because as we know, research is infinite and there's so much to do. And so we're suggesting that there's a possibility that we would have income from the sale of uh, GMP, it's medical grade MDMA. Um, we'll also have a therapist training program. We'll be required to train therapists in our method before the FDA will permit them to prescribe. And then we'll have our own network of clinics. <laughs> and so <laughs> we want to um, sort of set a model of care. Others can do this as well. And uh, <laughs> now, a couple of weeks ago, President Obama announced a $100 million brain initiative. And it was really exciting. This is to understand the mind. What he said was, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away, and we can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. And we'll know we've really succeeded when we have the $100 million, oh, oops. <laughs> Well, this is supposed to be a psychedelic brain initiative. I don't know how that happened. Um, and so, um, you know, we're still a work in progress. <laughs> and um, we can see that we have uh, President Obama's thanking Bia and uh, Amanda and Dave and Bob and I for this initiative. Thank you to Photoshop. Um, now, in our. Um, in the lifetime, I, I'm now uh, 59. I'll turn 60 this year uh, in roughly eight to 10 years when I. Around the time I turn 70, I think we'll have uh, MDMA as a prescription medicine, and I'll be able to become a, a full-time legal psychedelic psychotherapist. That's my hope. I think starting at 18 and ending at 70 to start my career <laughs> is, is a good deal. <laughs> I think um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things that um, gives me a lot of hope of, that we can accomplish this is from our uh, Swiss LSD study. 
and one of the, which you'll hear about later today from Peter Gasser. Um, it's with uh, people who are anx anxious about end of life. And the important thing, one of the most important things is that 11 out of the 12 of the subjects in that study had never done LSD before. So we're able to bring this not to, to, new, to people that are not from this underground culture or not from this culture. And I think we can do that in a larger scale as well. And so this conference is a way to bring us all together to try to um, help us learn from each other. And so I'd like to really encourage you to be bold, ask your best questions, uh, listen as carefully as you can, uh, help us plan the future, enjoy the present, and welcome to Psychedelic Science 2013. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I love that idea about the Pentagon. Weren't we levitating the Pentagon just a few decades ago? Uh, the next speaker um, is uh, Amanda Fielding. Amanda is the founder and director of the Beckley Foundation, which she set up in 1998, uh, following a lifelong interest in consciousness research. Um, uh, at Beckley, they do a wide range of projects investigating the neurophysiology, pharmacology, and subjective effects of psychoactive substances, such as cannabis, psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, uh, and legal highs, for that matter. Her research work elucidates the neuroscientific underpinnings of consciousness and investigates how psychoactive substances work and how consciousness, consciousness may be enhanced and explores new potential therapeutic applications. Uh, Amanda and the Beckley Foundation do some of the most innovative research um, and scholarship, and uh, she brings a bold voice to uh, changing policy uh, globally um, and in Britain. So I'll turn you over to the capable hands of Amanda. Hello, thank you for having me here. And it's very nice and beautifully organized. Um, I hope you'll forgive me for reading. What a lot has happened over the last two years. At last, touch wood, the tide appears to be on the turn in both science and policy. And finally, the potential benefits of psychedelics are beginning to be recognized. In 1998, I became a foundation, a course of action I highly recommend to all of you. <laughs> I set up the Beckley Foundation to work in two complementary areas, science and policy. The aim of the policy program was to reform global drug policy by encouraging evidence-based policies founded on the principles of health, harm reduction, cost-effectiveness, and human rights. The aim of the scientific program was to break the taboo on scientific research in how, into how the psychedelics and cannabis affect brain function and consciousness, and into how they might be used to benefit mankind. It has been a long, hard journey, but finally we're seeing results in both policy and science, each feeding the other. Over the last two years, the Beckley Foundation Policy Program has achieved some exciting breakthroughs. In 2011, we launched our global initiative for drug policy reform with an international conference at the House of Lords in London and a public letter calling for an end on the war on drugs and for new approaches based on scientific evidence. The letter was signed by seven former presidents, including Jimmy Carter, and two ruling presidents, 12 Nobel laureates, and dozens of global notables, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In 2012, I was invited by President Otto Perez Molina of Guatemala to advise him and his government on how to reform drug policy so as to lower violence and corruption. To that end, we produced a report, Paths for Reform, which he announced at Davos. I also advised the president to convene a summit of Latin American presidents to be chaired by Jimmy Carter. This summit will take place later this year at the Mayan Pyramid of Tikal in Guatemala. It will be chaired by Presidents Perez Molina and Jimmy Carter and by George Soros. The president... <laughs> The President of Guatemala 
is the world's leading advocate for the reform of global drug policy. The ill-conceived prohibitionist policies of the last 50 years have caused more global suffering than any other policy. The time has now come for drug policies to be based on scientific evidence and for the scientific community to open up the doors of research into the potential benefits of psychoactive substances. Consciousness is the core of our being. Psychedelic compounds have the capacity to change this core so as to loosen it from the constraints of its conditioning and open it up to new fields of awareness. Our ancient forebearers recognized the value of these altered states of consciousness and made them the central core of their society, out of which religion, culture, and healing grew. Modern man has made a terrible mistake by criminalizing this magic key to man's deeper soul, a key which opens up his capacity for greater compassion, awareness, and creativity. We here today are incredibly lucky to be at the forefront of the task of correcting this mistake and opening up the potential for society to make use of this most valuable aid. It is only by gaining a scientific understanding of how these substances work in the brain that we will be able to free them from the misconceptions of the taboo and harness their capacity to help man overcome some of his problems and develop more fully. In the 50s and 60s, LSD was hailed as the new wonder drug for psychotherapy and the development of a better understanding of consciousness. Its prohibition in 1967 ended this scientific flowering. Ethical approvals became virtually impossible to obtain. Scientists, institutions, and funders shunned the field for fear of jeopardizing their reputations. I grew up in the 60s before psychedelics became illegal. I recognized LSD as an incredible enhancer of potential an opener of doors to new fields of awareness and cognition, and to emotional and spiritual development. I realized the importance of gaining scientific understanding into how these powerful substances work in the brain and how they might best be harnessed um, to the use and benefit of mankind. It was incredibly sad to see the cancer of prohibition spread under the banner of the war on drugs. Not only have these prohibitionist policies caused devastating collateral damage to public health, society, and human rights, but they have also prevented 80% of the world's po population having access to pain-killing medication and have blocked one of the most promising fields of scientific research in a manner reminiscent of the excesses of the Inquisition. I was highly aware of the absurdity of the classification system for drugs in the UK and the US. In 2003, I approached the leading British neuroscientist, Professor Colin Blakemore, to propose a new classification system for drugs, including alcohol and tobacco, which would evaluate both the harms and benefits of each substance. But the concept of benefits was at that time taboo, so no research into them had been done. So, at the Beckley Seminar of 2003, Colin presented a paper describing a scientifically based scale of harm for all social drugs. This scale was later developed by Professor David Nutt, who happily will be here on Sunday to talk about the Beckley Imperial Scientific Program and in 2007, this paper was published in The Lancet and has since become internationally influential. It demonstrates the fact that the current scheduling of drugs on which sentencing is based has no scientific basis. Alcohol, which currently kills 2.5 million people globally each year, and tobacco, which kills 5 million, 
are legal, while MDMA and the psychedelics, which kill hardly anyone, are in the higher schedule of harms, defined as having no medical use, and attracting jail sentences whose length would make even Stalin hesitate. <laughs> now, Now, at last, we're beginning to build the evidence base of those benefits, and that is something to celebrate. However, although the process has begun, there are still enormous obstacles because of the illegal status of the substances, which makes them fantastically difficult and expensive to work with. Under the UN Drug Conventions, the severity of control of these compounds is on a par with that for nuclear weapons. On Sunday afternoon, I will be presenting with our collaborators two projects from the Beckley Foundation scientific program. Firstly, Roland Griffiths, Matt Johnson, and I will be talking about our collaboration at John Hopkins, the first pilot study in modern times to use a psychedelic as an aid in overcoming addiction in this case, using psilocybin to overcome nicotine addiction. The results so far have been outstandingly successful. They show that with the aid of psilocybin, psychotherapy can overcome even the most treatment-resistant addiction. They also demonstrate how valuable it would be to follow up this pilot study with a full clinical trial. Secondly, David Nutt, Robin Kehart Harris, and I will be discussing the latest exciting developments in the Beckley Imperial Psychopharmacological Research Program, which has now completed some pioneering neuroscientific studies into the effect of psilocybin and MDMA. These studies provide important new insights into how these compounds alter brain function thereby adding to our understanding of that most elusive but central concept, consciousness. Our psilocybin study showed for the first time how, in the resting state, psilocybin reduces the blood flow, particularly to the default mode network, the DMN. This system sits at the top of the brain's hierarchy exerting a top-down control of other brain regions, which feed their information into the DMN to be either repressed or rooted onwards. This default mode network is a major part of the physiological basis of the ego and superego, as described by Freud. Interestingly, the subjective strength of the psychedelic experience was correlated with the degree of reduction of blood supply to the default mode network. By reducing the blood flow to the DMN and reducing its repressive activity, sensory and emotional impulses, which would normally be repressed, can reach consciousness. And users experience a more spontaneous and unconstrained mode of thinking, a more fluid and plastic state of consciousness. This state more readily allows access to areas of the brain normally kept repressed. There is a loosening of ego boundaries so that the distinction between inner and outer worlds becomes blurred. This facilitates access to more spiritual and novel modes of thinking and to repress trauma. The default mode network comprises high-level cortical centers that are highly connected to each other and to subcortical systems. These centers include the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. Interestingly, the medial prefrontal cortex is hyperactive in depression. And the fact that psilocybin reduces its activity suggests that psilocybin could be a novel treatment for depression. 
This discovery has resulted in the UK Medical Research Council providing over £500,000 to undertake a clinical study to further investigate the treatment of depression with psilocybin. Our MDMA study, <laughs> our MDM stu MDMA study has shown how MDMA reduces blood supply to the limbic area and how it results in the experience of positive memories being more positive than with placebo and in the experience of negative memories being less painful. This gives a neuroscientific explanation of why MDMA can be such a valuable ally in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. It both facilitates access to repressed memories and makes them less painful to recall and therefore easier to work through and reintegrate into consciousness. The Beckley Imperial College Research Program has thus already provided new understanding about consciousness itself, a promising new pathway for treating one of the scourges of our times, depression, and a new scientific explanation of why MDMA and psilocybin can provide such invaluable aids to the psychotherapy of mental trauma. Looking forward, we have recently received ethical approvals for the world's first study to investigate the effects of LSD using the latest brain imaging technology, fMRI and MEG. I so look forward to not only researching how LSD can help treat many of man's mental and physical illnesses, but also how it can help stimulate creativity and a higher level of awareness. Less constrained by the shackles of conditioning. And after LSD, we will investigate the effects of ayahuasca and cannabis. And finally, at the day of the 70th anniversary of Albert Hoffman's first intentional LSD trip, I'm happy to announce that the Beckley Foundation, in collaboration with Oxford University Press, have just co-published a new edition of Elbert's book, LSD, My Problem Child, and Insights Outlooks, beautifully translated by Jonathan Ott. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Um, next up is uh, Bob Jesse. Bob Jesse is convener of the Council on Spiritual Practices, CSP.org. Um, Bob was instrumental in forming the psilocybin research team at Johns Hopkins University and has co-authored three of its scientific papers. He also led the writing of an amicus brief for the US Supreme Court in support of the Unio de Vegetal, the UDVs. Um, use of sacramental tea containing dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is a controlled substance. Uh, subsequently, a unanimous court upheld the UDV's right to its practice. Uh, Bob, Bob's work and uh, very important, and maybe Bob, you'll, you'll share with us the prospects for um, ayahuasca spiritual experiences uh, at a uh, church or synagogue near you. Um, uh, lastly, Bob's work uh, draws liberally from the non-creedal, non-hierarchical ways of the Quakers, the Religious Society of Friends. Bob? Mm, good morning, everyone. <coughs> Happy Bicycle Day. Thank you to Tom Roberts, who's probably here someplace, for naming Bicycle Day and being a consistent stand for acknowledging it. Uh, thank you to Tom as an elder, and thank you for the tradition. Let's see. There we go. I'd like to invite everyone to um, get comfortable in your chairs, maybe 
straighten up a little bit and get your legs comfortable. Get your seat firmly planted in the chair. You might find it helpful to close your eyes for a moment and, and attend to your breathing. Feel your weight sinking into the chair and the, the chair connecting with the ground and the earth. Uh, I'd like to invite you to answer a question which a friend asked me last night. I found it very helpful. And the question is, why are you here? What brought you to this conference? What do you hope to be able to give to this work, to this group of people? What might you receive from this group of people, from this weekend we have together? Beyond that, what motivates what you want to give and what you want to receive? Is there a yearning? Yeah, thank you for contemplating that. Uh, let me share you my answer to that question and answer to that question. And I'd like to do it by asking for some shows of hands. Uh, this is in the form of an informal survey. Please feel very free to not participate for any or all questions. Number one, if you have participated in a clinical trial of a psychedelic or MDMA or cannabis, or if you think you might participate in a clinical trial in, say, the next two years for depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, et cetera, would you please raise your hand? I know we do have some research volunteers here. And have a look around. Okay, everyone see that? Thank you. Uh, question number two. Imagine some years down the road, uh, those charts that Rick put up, that all comes to pass, and psychedelically assisted treatment for PTSD, depression, anxiety, etc., cetera, uh, are now routinely available. You don't need to be a clinical research volunteer. Uh, again, I'm, please don't answer this if it's uncomfortable for you. If you actually have PTSD or clinically significant depression or anxiety, et cetera, and would seek treatment if it were routinely available legally, would you please raise your hand? Okay, third question. Imagine some place on planet Earth where you could take these materials without a medical need. Beautiful place in the woods or beautiful awe-inspiring architecture with friends, whatnot. Uh, and again, with no medical need, you can just go do this in some appropriately contained and safeguarded setting. And it's legal. Imagine further that you had the money and the time to go to that place. How many people would do that? <laughs> Please have a look around. Keep your hands up. There we go. That's why I'm here. Look at the slide. Uh, it took a little while to come up with a term to encompass that. I decided to call it for the time being the betterment of well people. The therapeutic work is supremely important. I resonate very deeply with the vision that Rick has shared of what humanity has done to itself for so long. Uh, why it is that we keep generating these cycles of violence and the trauma that it leaves in the aftermath. So for all of you who are healers and you are engaged in any aspect of the healing part of this work, a deep bow to you. And why I'm here is this. So one question that we often focus on is, you know, boy, how can we get this legally or, or what material will we take or how do we do this? Um, it's becoming increasingly clear to me that the substance itself or the session or the insights that you gain in the course of a couple of hours or a day um, it's very important, but it's not at all the end of the game. The end of the game in a therapeutic context is called something like integration, where you spend some hours with the therapist and you see the, the person a week later or a month later until the trauma is actually taken care of and kind of put to rest. What about the insights gained from sessions outside of that kind of context? Uh, I'd like to offer for your consideration the notion that integration actually takes a lifetime. That is the work of a lifetime. 
And we would do well to generate for ourselves longitudinally stable, multi-generational contexts that really support that integration, that see what's going on. So we can lean on each other, we can prod each other a little bit, we can support each other, we can celebrate with each other. So I'm very interested in, in the social context, the non-medical social context that would support that process over a lifetime. And if you share that uh, interest and enthusiasm, I'd, that'd be a great thing to talk about this weekend. When I think about the social context, I think about what are called communities, traditions. Bicycle Day is a great tradition. We have, we have a tradition. We have a widely shared tradition, and it's wonderful. I look forward to it every year. I don't always celebrate it intensely, uh, but it's just nice to know that it's on the calendar, and if you say Bicycle Day to someone in this room, we know what it means. Do we have other shared traditions? Or maybe you have other smaller communities. Maybe they're associated with a, a more conventional received religion. Maybe it's a group of friends that will get together every Thanksgiving and do a certain thing. How important is that in your lives? And what's it look like to generate these traditions and keep them going on and to pass them along to successive generations? Another thing that comes to mind under the rubric of social contexts, social vessels, is lineage. Surely it's the case for everyone in the room that we can name individuals that have been very formative to us, not only in our families of origin, but teachers, mentors, someone who, who, who took us under our wings, shared with us important insights, helped us through difficult moments, inspired our work onto the next stage. Would you take a moment, please? Again, get comfortable in your seat. Maybe close your eyes if it's helpful. And bring to mind some of the people who have been deeply influential in your lives. I know that for me there are people whose influence has been so strong that I can't imagine what my life would have been like in the absence of that. So please take a moment and, and enjoy that immersion. What have you learned from these people? What has it felt like to be in the presence of such a person? What bonds of affection or love have you had for a mentor or a teacher? Thank you. Uh, I'll share with you some of my answer to that question. I've chosen here the people that have been deeply meaningful to me, some of whom I've never met, some of whom I've met, and a few of whom have become very close personal friends and mentors. And this is all under the rubric of the betterment of well people. These are people whose names and pictures you might recognize, who have been interested in psychedelics in one way or another, and theogens, and who have not felt constrained by the medical model. Uh, of course, this list could go back hundreds, thousands of years, but I'm just choosing an arbitrary start point and saying William James, probably the most famous, first famous American psychologist, who among many scholarly works wrote the varieties of religious experience, and who famously said of his own experimentation with nitrous oxide, if nothing else can be said about them, they prevent us from prematurely foreclosing our accounts of ultimate reality. That's a paraphrase. But if there's nothing else you get out of these experiences, you can't be too certain. We should keep on looking. Uh, he has influenced so many people around the world. Next down the line, Aldous Huxley. We all know wrote Doors of Perception, many novels. And if you don't know his novel, Island, uh, that was very influential for me. His late wife, Laura Huxley, reckoned that it may be his most important work, although maybe underappreciated. If you ask the question, what could entheogens or psychedelics look like in society? How could they benefit us? Actually, somebody asked me that recently and wanted to answer an email, and I started typing replies, and everything I did for a sentence or two, I deleted because it seemed too simple. It wasn't rich enough. 
It didn't have enough warnings or caveats or, well, this might happen, but there might be this unintended consequence. And I actually think you need to write a book to answer that question. Huxley did it for us. And that's one version of the story. That's one possible unfolding. Of the people here, this is just not going the direction I wanted to. There we go. These people in particular have done something uh, for which I'm very, very grateful. I grew up in a nominally church-going household and loved the choir and the incense and the pageantry of it. Uh, and after a while, couldn't make sense of some of what was recited as doctrine. In fact, it seemed pretty anti-scientific to me. And I found myself disengaging from religion. You know, not thinking about it a lot, but just, you know, religion is not science. In fact, religion is anti-science. And it's taken some decades and a lot of mentoring and coaching and inspiration from these people and others to learn to reframe that word, to understand the word religion differently. By the way, I, I would regard that as an exercise in open-mindedness, to be willing to let go of our quick responses to a word and look for deeper meaning, to hold on to what serves, and to let go of what doesn't serve. So I'm extremely grateful to these people, some of whom have personally shown me um, how to say it. Uh, the baby that I may have thrown out with the bathwater. <laughs> Last thing I'd like to say, many of us have been involved in this work for quite a long time. And I think it's a fairly common phenomenon that when you first start, you think, oh boy, if we just do this one thing, then in you know, a couple of years, five years, the world will be different and kind of that'll be done. And you get involved in it and say, wow, <laughs> Wow, a couple years later, and yeah, that thing got done, but the work isn't done. So as somebody said, what starts out looking like a sprint or a short race begins after a while looking like a marathon. Oh boy, I guess we're in it for the long haul. And after you've been doing it for a long enough time, you start to realize that this fits into a very long arc crossing generations. And maybe it's not even a marathon, maybe it's a relay race. So that's what comes to mind when I think about community and longitudinal stability and work that passes across the generations. That's not to say don't do what's in front of us today. If there's suffering in front of us today and we can alleviate suffering, let's go ahead and do that too. But there's some comfort that I have in being able to step back and say, we'll do our work and in the great unfolding, all will be well. Thank you. I want to say my influential lineage, although I'm older than some of them, is standing right here and you've been listening to this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, our next speaker this morning is Dave Nichols. Um, Dave Nichols, PhD, is president, co-founder, and director of preclinical research of the Hefter Research Institute. That's at hefter.org. Uh, um, Dr. Nichols originally conceived of a privately funded Institute as the most effective mechanism for bringing research on psychedelic agents into the modern era of neuroscience. And this vision led to the founding of the Hefter Research Institute in 1993. Among scientists, um, Dave is recognized as one of the foremost experts on the medical chemistry of hallucinogens. His high standards and more than four decades of research experience set the tone to ensure that rigorous methods and quality science are pursued by the Institute. And Dave tells me he's been working with psychedelics since 1969, an enormous lineage there as well. Dave, thank you. I don't have prepared remarks, so hopefully I'll stay under my 15 minutes of allotted time. Uh, this is a great event, and I would like to personally express my thanks to Rick Doblin for organizing it. Uh, the Hefter Institute is a virtual institute. We don't do any uh, publicity stuff. We don't uh, send out things. We have a newsletter for donors. But this gives us uh, the chance to show what we've been doing. So, Rick, thank you for putting this together. It's a, it's a great thing you've done. Uh, I am a chemist, and when I started this work in 1969, when I started my graduate studies, the only other chemist in the field was Sasha Shogun. 
And I'd also, although I don't believe he's here, I'd like to uh, thank him for his inspiration and pioneering efforts in the field that really helped me when I was getting started. So Sasha has been a big influence for me. So. <clears throat> So I retired from Purdue University uh, last June. I was, a, I was a named professor in pharmacology and also a distinguished professor in medicinal chemistry. And I just got kind of tired of the BS and the paperwork and not having enough money and so forth and thought, I'm going to retire, move to Chapel Hill. A colleague there said, well, why don't you do an indefinite sabbatical in my lab? I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. Uh, my wife and I have three of our four grandchildren live an hour away in Greensboro. So but I've been going into the lab every morning. Uh, I have a bench there and I do some chemistry. And I was sitting next to George Greer at dinner last night. And he says, so Dave, you go in and you do lab work. You're actually doing chemistry in the lab every day? And I said, yes. He said, you need to stop telling people that you've retired. So I'm semi-retired. <clears throat> but we still have lots of good things to do. Um, Somebody asked me after I had uh, put together the Hefter Institute years ago, so what is your hope? What do, you, what do you think will happen in the future? And I said, well, someday, probably long after I'm dead, there will be a psychiatrist slash shaman that operates an office. And you'll go in and you'll be in your mid-40s having a midlife crisis or an existential crisis. And your doctor will say, you know, I think you need to have a psychedelic therapy session. And you'll go to that person and you'll have a psychedelic therapy session. It'll help you get a perspective on what's going on in your life, et cetera. And they said, after you're dead, that's kind of like, isn't that awful? I mean, after you're dead? And I said, well, you know, you have to start somewhere. I mean, I <clears throat> <laughs> but you know, it might happen before I die now. And it's really exciting. Um, the other comment I would make is I would get invited to some of these meetings that were sort of conferences of the uh, Ann Shulgin calls, them the tr calls you all the tribe. And I was typically the one that was most overdressed because I was the token scientist they'd bring in to talk. And there would be shamans and drummers and all kinds of uh, unusual people, different people there. And I was the most straight one there. And I've noticed this morning that I'm the only one without a tie. We've got Rick Doblin wearing, or without a jacket. Rick Doblin's wearing a jacket. Bob Jesse's wearing a jacket. Everybody's dressed up. So it's kind of a comment on how far the field has come that I'm the least. <laughs> Uh, the most underdressed. But I really couldn't imagine uh, how much progress we've made. Um, as the Hefter Institute, we've been here around since 93, and as we've gone on and published uh, and done more and more things, we've attracted more donors, and things are really starting to grow. It's really been exciting. And I'm not going to preempt all the talks. There are a lot of Hefter people here, uh, Charlie Grobe, Steve Ross, Roland uh, Griffiths, Franz Bollenweider, that will tell you more specifically what they're doing. Uh, go to our website. We've actually sponsored uh, 50, over 50 research publications dealing with psychedelics. Uh, Franz Bollenweider has the preeminent lab in the world looking at uh, brain imaging and the effects of psychedelics and has done literally hundreds of subjects uh, given uh, psilocybin, MDMA, amphetamine, ketamine. Um, you know, Charlie Grove did the first study of psilocybin in terminal patients. We published that in 2010. And the results are so encouraging, we expanded that study. And there's a larger study at New York University under the direction of Steve Ross, Dr. Steve Ross. Uh, and they're about two-thirds of the way through the recruitment there of 33 patients, dying patients. Roland Griffiths is doing a similar study, although the patients don't have to be terminal, at Johns Hopkins, using psilocybin to treat uh, people that have uh, distress over the diagnosis of a terminal illness. Uh, Michael Bogenschutz is uh, uh, about finished with a pilot study of psilocybin treating alcoholism. And what, from what I hear, the results are really amazing. You heard Amanda refer to the study of uh, psilocybin and smoking cessation. That's really given amazing results. And now we have plans to look at depression at a couple different sites. Franz is looking at the underlying basis for depression and how psilocybin might uh, treat that. Um, other studies with substance abuse are planned at New York University with psilocybin. So as we find more and more areas to go into, we're finding donors that step up and say, "Yeah, oh, we really like what you're doing. And the idea of the Hefter Institute was really to do it in a very uh, hardline, mainline scientific way. Because we realized in the 1950s and 60s, there were so many people giving these in what I would call an unauthorized and unsupervised manner. And it created a lot of the media hype that we saw. And when we started the Hefter, we all said, this has to be 
hardcore science because that's the only thing that the mainstream will understand. We have to have good scientific design, peer-reviewed protocols, and legitimate stuff published in the best journals. Charlie Grubb's study on psilocybin in uh, terminal cancer patients that was published was published in Archives of General Psychiatry. That is the top journal in the field. It's extremely difficult to get a paper in there. So that just shows the quality of the work that we've been trying to do. And I won't go on and on, but just to say uh, it's just amazing that we've gotten to where we are. And Rick said he may be able to have MDMA as a prescription drug in 2017. 2017? 2021. Uh, we may, maybe we'll get there in 2017, I don't know. <laughs> but <clears throat> we are, uh, as Rick has uh, taken maps to uh, work on the MDMA issue, Hefter has really focused on psilocybin. That was a conscious decision we made uh, at the time because there was really was no social stigma with respect to psilocybin. We debated should we use MDMA, should we use mescaline, should we use LSD, should we use psilocybin? And we went through the list of things. And in those days, 10 years or so ago, if you went up to someone on the street and said, do you know what psilocybin is? No. You know what, you've heard of magic mushrooms, shrooms? Oh yeah, I think so. And now, if you go up to people and say, have you heard of psilocybin? There's been so much press coverage that a lot of people say, oh yeah, isn't that new drug they're using to treat uh, people who are dying, people with cancer? So the word is getting out. I mean, Rick and I and, and a lot of people in Hefter have been doing a lot of interviews. There's a lot of stories. There was just Popular Science just published an interview with me that's online. There's a lot of documentaries out there. People are starting to get the message. And I think uh, if we persevere, and, and obviously we're not going anyplace. Rick's not going anyplace. I'm not going anyplace. If we persevere, this is going to happen. So it's not probably going to be after I'm dead. I might actually see that. Uh, in 10 or 15 years, and I hope I'm not dead then. But, um, but it's really great, and I'm really uh, happy to see all of you here, and I think if we stick to the mission, uh, we can make changes. Uh, the government resists this continually, the, the medical marijuana thing, this rejection of, of marijuana is just absurd. Marijuana is in the schedule one, the most dangerous of drugs, and <clears throat> Hefter avoids getting into these political uh, issues, but it's obvious to scientists, and I represent Hefter, it's obvious to the scientists in Hefter that marijuana is not the kind of bugaboo uh, that everyone would have, the government would have people believe. We all know that, and I, I'm preaching to the choir here. But we have to make these changes happen, and the way they happen is by producing hard data. The regulators and the bureaucrats, what they appreciate is hard data. We've treat, you know, we, we will have treated 80-some patients with psilocybin who are, have a terminal diagnosis. And if we go to somebody at any agency and say, we've treated almost 90 people and we've gotten statistically st significant results, it works. There's nothing, there's no recourse. They can't say, well, you're a bunch of crazy hippies. No, here's the, here are the data. These data were generated at Johns Hopkins University, at New York University, at UCLA. These are the facts, and that's what we have to do. That's what we are doing, and it's going to happen. Thank you all for your support. Uh, you can support Hefter if you want to. We'd love it, uh, but your emotional support and just hanging in there and, and being part of the process, it's great. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, go to some of the Hefter talks. I think you'll uh, see a lot of what we're doing, and uh, thanks again, Rick. It's a great conference. Thank you, Dave. Um, so the final opening remark of the morning is going to be by Beatrice Kube Labate, um, PhD. Uh, Bia earned her doctorate in social anthropology from the State University of Campinas in Brazil. Um, she's now visiting professor at the Drug Policy Program of the Center for Economic Research and Education in Mexico. Um, she's author and co-author and co-editor of eight books, two English translations, one journal special edition, and several peer-reviewed articles. She's an upcoming star in that ever ongoing lineage that Bob Jesse talked about. Hi, everyone. I normally like to talk, but um, this involves a lot of emotions to me in English, so I decided to read for you. I'm very pleased to be here today. I want to thank the conference organizers for their openness to the topic of ayahuasca and the participants of the ayahuasca track for accepting my invitation to join our gathering. I would also like to thank my university, CIDES, CIDE in Aguascalientes, Mexico, and thank you all for coming. I'm happy to stand here today and see this big audience united, more than 275 years 
after a Jesuit missionary first reported on ayahuasca use in Peru. More than 150 years after botanist Richard Spruce identified Bunisteriopsis use among the Indians of the Northwest Amazon. 90 years after its active principles were isolated. 80 years after DMT was synthesized in, lab in a laboratory for the first time. 50 years after Burroughs and Ginsberg published their classic book, Yaget Letters. 37 years after Terence McKenna and Kat Harrison, who's my good friend and who's here now, uh, and who was in her mid-twenties then, took off uh, for their trip to Peru. And 28 years after a conference in Bogota, which held a pioneering uh, symposium on ayahuasca. All this happened at a time when it was not possible to type ayahuasca into Google in your computer. Ever since the Europeans colonized the New World and discovered the Amazon, the jungle and indigenous populations have been fascinating us. Ayahuasca or Yage seems to derive its power, as anthropologist Michael Tosik puts it, from the Amazon forests and its populations. The Amazon is fertile, mysterious, creative, and powerful, but it is also dangerous, hostile, chaotic, and demoniac. Colonial imagination attributed special magical abilities to the inhabitants of the forest, the tropical Indians. Their supposed wildness, mirrored, mirrored in the wilderness of the forest, could heal the white man and colonial wounds. After a long journey of persecution and banishment by colonizers, followed by prohibitionist drug policies, we can observe the spread of ayahuasca rituals throughout Europe and North America. And together with this, a huge expansion in the scientific study of ayahuasca. This vine has definitely become an interest of the academic world and seems to be here to stay. In the words of Brazilian historian Henrique Carneiro, as tele telescopes are to the astronomy and microscopes to biology, psychedelic drugs represent the primary techno-scientific tool of knowledge of the mind. I think it is safe to say that we are co-protagonists in the largest event ever about ayahuasca on planet Earth. There will be one community forum, five films, and more than 30 presentations. The ayahuasca track is, always go is also going to launch our book, Ayahuasca and Health, Ayahuasca Salud. Our track is multidisciplinary. It includes perspectives from the disciplines of neuroscience, neurobiology, psychiatry, pharmacology, ethnopharmacology, ethnobotany, psychology, public health, epi epidemiology, anthropology, law, and education. Presenters have come from Brazil, USA, Canada, Germany, Spain, Peru, and Mexico. The main focus of the ayahuasca track is on the therapeutic potential of ayahuasca. Presentations will explore the ritual and clinical uses of the substance in the treatment and management of various diseases and ailments, especially its role in psychological well-being, quality of life, and in shaping identity. They will particularly address ayahuasca's promising potentials as adjunct to psychotherapy for substance dependence, and in some cases, in some cases to depression and PTSD. The biomedical and psychological research presented in the track ranges from neurophysiological aspects of visions to the use of neuroscience tools to compare dream states and psychedelic states. From the neuropsychological evaluation of ayahuasca drinkers to investigation of long-term effects on mental health, potential side effects, toxicity, interaction with antidepressants and mental disorders. Health, health, illness, and current are analyzed through the lens of anthropology as well, particularly in religious and shamanic settings. The track investigates the boundary between shamanism, religion, and medicine, examining hybridization across the diverse knowledge bases of ayahuasca practices. Our collaborators do not avoid controversial topics, such as the role of economics, cultural and ritual translations, ayahuasca tourism, 
sexual abuse, ethics, legal pluralism, and religious freedom. We hope that the ayahuasca trap track helps to legitimize the scientific study of ayahuasca and encourages more researchers to study this topic. We have contract with the German Springer Publishing to produce a book out of this conference, The Therapeutic Use of Ayahuasca. In sum, it is a true joy to unite the top experts of the world on this topic with the ayahuasca global, uh, the global ayahuasca drinking community in a congenial California atmosphere. I love California and I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Welcome to, the, to our world of researchers, friend, friends, kin, enemies, active principles, ancestors, non-humans, plant spirits, and molecules. I hope you... <laughs> I hope you will all come, jo come join us in the ayahuasca track to discuss the nature of this hallucinogen, religious sacrament, medicinal plant, magical potion, and its incredible potentials to shedding light onto the nature of the mind, body, and spirit. Thank you, and welcome to Psychedelic Science 2013.